We're here though to talk about our next video in the series, the third main topic of the overall aim mechanics, uh, which is target switching. Um, and in this video, we're gonna be talking, typically target switching is broken into two uh, different types of target switching. One is flick target switching, and then the other is more evasive target switching. Uh, we're gonna be talking about flick or speed target switching as it's referred to depending on which benchmarks you're looking at. What is target switching? Uh, target switching is essentially your ability to move your crosshair quickly between two targets. Typically this is two targets that are on a wide angle. It's usually referring to low TTK or time to kill basically. It takes, it doesn't take a very long time to eliminate the targets. COD is a pretty common example of a type of game where there's a lot of target switching because there's so many targets on screen and they, uh, you, you have a lot of ammo in your weapon and it doesn't take a lot of damage to kill people. So you'll see it often if there's a lot of targets on screen that need to be eliminated quickly or in games that have higher TTK like Apex Legends, there are multiple targets on wide angles. Or if there's kind of like a spray transfer situation where you're doing damage to one target and then instead of not shooting, stopping, uh, firing your gun and then moving to another target, you just quickly flick to another target to continue in that same clip doing damage to the next target. And this is used for multiple different reasons in FPS games. One is to keep pressure on multiple different enemies. Uh, it's for optimizing damage uptime. If you know you have so many bullets in your gun and if you run out of bullets, you have to switch to a second gun normally as a backup gun. Uh, there's a lot of time involved with that. You know, microseconds that can add up actually in FPS games. The time it takes for you to switch to a second gun could be enough time for the enemy to kill you. There's somebody behind a door or hiding in a corner or you just didn't see that they were there. You weren't aware of their presence um, and then if you're good at target switching, you can quickly flick your gun and point your gun at them and start doing damage to them. Whereas if you weren't good at target switching, they would probably be able to start shooting you and kill you before you could kill them. So what do speed target switching or TS benches test you on? Uh, most people think that the most important skill that you need in target switching is speed, your ability to move your mouse across the mouse pad as quickly as possible. While that's true, uh, I mean, it's in the name, right? Speed TS. Uh, what it's really testing you on is your ability to quickly acquire a target, flick to it, and then stay on target while tracking it and using as few bullets as possible. And so what you need there is flick accuracy. You need stability after flicking. So when you land on a target, if you move your mouse very quickly, often what happens is your hand does this little movement. It's like a little shake, right? Because you are moving at a high momentum. Your hand's moving at a high momentum. And so when you need to stop, you need stopping power, right? Unless your hand is, is stable, your crosshair is gonna wiggle off of the target and then you're not doing damage to it in that time. Static uh, has a built-in technique called micro adjusting to help you with your flick accuracy. Like basically if you're, if you're not as good at landing on your targets when you flick to them, um, you can do the micro adjustment and move on, right? Um, but in target switching, you are penalized a lot heavier for your flick accuracy, for your shakiness, for waste and movement, unclean lines, over and under flicking. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about is actually improving that component of your aim technique. And it's something that you should be consciously thinking about when you're training for target switching. Settings wise, uh, you'll be using a higher FOV than you're used to in most of the target switching scenarios. Uh, 115 to 125 Overwatch is usually recommended. I use 115 for pretty much everything except for the PAT TS sends or 360 sends if you're doing any that have like a 360 angle. You'll actually see in the Voltaic benches and guides, they usually suggest using source FOV. And I think that's a little much. I personally would just stick to 115 and 125 Overwatch. And the reason for this is because in order for you to be able to flick to targets, uh, you need to be able to see them and, and know they're there. So a lot of times you're going to 
have no targets visible to you on screen because of the fact that they're just off screen and you know they're off screen but you don't know exactly where they are so you just kind of like mindlessly flick and hope that you land near it and then you have to correct uh, you just kind of want to minimize that it just re reduces the randomness um, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to do kind of like a mysterious flick. So don't worry, you're going to be building that technique. And in terms of like the targets, the colors, the walls, you could just follow the moving dots, backgrounds generally. I also just use solid color walls. You can use either one that the targets are going to be moving. So having some kind of lines in the background like brick or concrete tiles can help you notice their movement and track their movement better. And sensitivity wise, so I actually like using a higher sense on uh, target switching and it feels fine for me. Um, you might have some trouble with it at first. I run at 21 CM for most of the target switching sends. I think it helps with developing your stability and your smoothness because you're basically raising the skill ceiling a bit. And you'll find if you can get used to it, you'll find it just feels better because of the often you're doing really wide flicks. So it's just using less of your mouse pad to do it ultimately is what it comes down to if you're able to control that sensitivity. The primary technique is building on what you learned in static, except now you're holding down mouse one. And a lot of people ask, you know, why do you hold down mouse one? So we hold down mouse one for a couple of reasons. One is to optimize your damage uptime and to optimize your scores. Obviously, it's sort of like Pokeball in that sense. If you did a lot of Pokeball training and static, this will be very familiar to you. It helps you understand the weight of the mouse under your hand. It helps you with spray transferring. I talked about spray transferring a little bit earlier. In real games and real fights in FPS, a lot of the times when you're doing target switching, you're doing it with the mouse held down. You think you might be wasting a lot of bullets. It's actually better to do that because once you get good at target switching and you have clean, accurate flicks, you actually don't lose that many bullets at all along the way. The ability for you to do damage that much quicker to the target because you don't have to wait for your gun to spin up, especially if there's spin up associated with it, that's time that you're wasting that you could actually be doing damage to a target. Like I mentioned, you know, this is going to be very similar to static in terms of what you should be prioritizing. You want to prioritize clean lines. You want to prioritize moving from target to target uh, and understanding what your next target's going to be. Uh, ahead of time so you have like what is referred to as like a kill chain you have a, a, a list of targets that you want to be eliminating moving your mouse as little as possible and as efficiently as possible while you're doing this and of course there's going to be the first fast flick and then a micro adjustment afterwards um, if you need it think about consciously while you're doing target switching of minimizing the amount of micro adjusting that you need to do if you watch some of the best target switchers out there like unans gord um, you will see that they very rarely need to micro adjust. So the priority of your effort to improve should be focused around minimizing waste. In terms of priority order of what you wanna be looking at when you're reviewing your VODs or just paying attention to while you're practicing is your stability in your flicks, your flick accuracy and your precision basically, how clean your lines are when going from target to target, your target selection, and and choosing the right targets in the right order and then near the bottom speed last i know it sounds crazy because at speed i'm saying when you're practicing i'm not saying that you don't move fast you should be moving at a faster rate like you should still be doing a fast flick but don't think that speed is the first thing that you need to work on and develop unlike moving dots the penalties for having jitter are much greater here the difference between okay runs and great runs are due to how often you can land on the target for a flick and how stable you are tracking it after the flick. In moving dots, you will feel a little bit of like kind of shakiness in your hand and that's pretty normal because it's largely centered around fingertip aim and that's just how your hand's gonna feel, especially when you're moving towards smaller and smaller targets. Um, in TS though, you really need to, especially when you get toward small targets, um, as you improve, like that's gonna that's gonna penalize you greatly. So you just need to understand that TS runs on very thin margins, and getting higher scores usually involves correcting minor mistakes that you're making, which add up over time. You don't want to linger on targets and need to absolutely see it's dead before moving on. A lot of times, 
you're actually going to be moving off the target before it's fully dead so that last little bit of damage that you need to do to kill it uh, happens as you're flicking off of it if that makes sense it's really about optimizing doing just the right amount of damage that you need and keeping up time on the targets as you're as you're moving your mouse across the the playing field now as far as target selection viability reading the map when we talked about moving dots and you might want to refer back to my other video if you want to revisit that topic in ts sends you're applying the same technique so and this is why i wanted to put ts in this order after moving dots because you're kind of building on what you're learning a big part of the viability now includes how the scoring works before in static and moving dots you're scored on whether or not you just kill a target period there's not a certain amount of damage and target switching you are actually scored based on the amount of damage for almost all the scenarios that you do whether or not you kill a bot okay and that's very important to understand because a lot of times when you're deciding on which targets that you should be prioritizing you should be prioritizing the ones that are closer to the center of the map um, instead of constantly going out toward the edges of the map unless you have to and you should be prioritizing switching to the bots that are either currently the most viable because there are other targets near it in the kill chain because you're thinking of how you can eliminate the most amount of targets in the least amount of time or because it is moving in a direction that's both an expected direction after you switch to it and it's going to lead to you being able to kill more bots that are in the same area and you want to just get in this habit of continually accurately flicking to your targets and moving on if either you don't do enough damage to fully kill it because you misread the ttk on it or because it moves in a direction that you didn't expect when we're, we're thinking about reading the map and you're thinking about viability those are some of the things that you should be putting in the forefront of your mind is, you know, not just clusters of bots, but where are they going to move after you flick to them? How much damage do you need to do to eliminate them? How much damage do they, have they already incurred? Are there other bots nearby that are also moving in a similar direction that, that you can read ahead of time in your periphery as you're building your tempo? And also a willingness to move off of a bot if it doesn't meet your viability criteria or if you've already started Started to do damage to it and it's actually going to be faster for you to flick off of it than it will be to continue to try to do that last bit of damage to kill it because you're just scored on how much damage that you're doing to the bots overall and not how many you've killed so in along similar lines this is probably where i would start suggesting that you pay attention to bot patterns um i i did mention pattern learning a little bit in moving dots and with target switching I think it's very important to understand the physics of how the bots move and it's also very important to understand how the maps are laid out and where bots can spawn you might be thinking well is this cheating or defeating the purpose of aim training i mean if you are basically memorizing where bots are and i don't think so and the reason why i don't think so is because it's playing an fps game like apex uh, or valorant or overwatch it's very common for people to go into like firing range type situations to understand what the recoil is, what the physics are like, what the TTK is like, right? Because in your head, you're just kind of establishing, you know, what is and isn't possible. And I think it's very important with target switching because there's so many targets that pop up on screen and there's a low TTK. The actual like patterns of where you can expect things to happen starts to become a lot more relevant. Like if, if you were just doing a tracking scenario that just had an invincible bot, you know that that bot is just gonna be the only target that's available to you on screen. But if you're doing target switching because you're killing so many bots and they're coming from so many different directions, those little nuances add up. And if you start moving your crosshair from like zero degrees to 180 degrees and back to zero over and over and over again, you're basically just killing your score uh, because you're not paying attention to 
the strategy of the map and how to approach it. So you can do this with trial and error. You can look at VODs. You can watch aimers on YouTube that are doing the scenarios like Vox TS, Pat TS, just to kind of see what's the art of possible. You can also do the static versions of the scenarios um, if they exist. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the scenario types and the beneficial routines. What it could end up happening if you are playing the scenarios incorrectly is you might be getting lower scores just because you're not solving the problem of the map correctly you could actually be doing the technique so it's very important to help you isolate what you need to improve and how to improve so the different scenario types this is a lot more simplified in ts i ended up grouping them into two different types and that's the moving type of target switching scenarios and then the static ones so in the moving ones the popular ones are like dev ts uh, zen you've got the tile frenzy ones kind of the old school ones uh, Pat TS is probably one of the most popular types out there. It's been around forever. Um, it's evolved over time. It used to be like more like a, a human figure type bot with a reload. And now it's just a, a little circle generally doesn't have reload. And Vox TS is another really popular one. Vox and Pat are probably the two best that you can do. I really like Zen too, because Zen gives you the wide angles. And there are static versions of these scenarios, most of them, I would say maybe even all of them. What separates them really is the various viewing angles that you get. Uh, the most common one that you're gonna see is really like a 180 type of viewing angle. And that's why we always recommend to play at a higher FOV so that you can see more of the screen. But there's also 90 degree viewing Ooh. angles, um, kind of the easier ones that focus more on speed. And then there's the 360 degree viewing angles um, to help with those wide angle switches. Uh, Viscos is somebody who really values prioritizing those 360 degree switches to help get better at hitting those real, almost guesswork switches, uh, like one t side of the screen to the next. And then there's Psalm TS. Uh, I didn't really know where to fit this in because it does have some amount of evasiveness to it, even though it's on just one plane, like it doesn't move further away from you or closer to you like they do in the evasive scenarios like Kin TS, uh, but it does have like a wave pattern that it does versus just a, a normal horizontal plane movement. So it's not quite evasive, but it doesn't really fit into all the other ones like Zen, Dev, Tile, Pat, and Box. For the static ones, you've got a lot of the Pokeball ones. Uh, Pokeball Wide R Aim is a popular one. You know, Pat, a uh, pure switch benchmark has pokeball sends and then of course it's got the various angles like 90 180 360. so and what's the difference between pokeball for static versus ts might be you know a question that you're asking yourself and for the most part the techniques are very similar um i would say they're almost the exact same pokeballs and static they're normally closer together you've got like hip fire ones you've got uh, Pokeball frenzy types. Once you get into the really wide wall type uh, scenarios, then it becomes much more like a target switching type scenario. And why is that? And I think for me, it's because the situations that you encounter in FPS games that do require target switching, where it is much more of like a target switching type technique, is when it's a, f a fast kind of like wide flick that does require an amount of stability like trying to think of it in slow motion where your hand goes like this and then it has to kind of correct itself afterwards right it's it has to stabilize itself and you don't really get that with the smaller dot clusters so what we can do now is kind of go through a few routines there's this is well tread territory so there's no benefit to me creating a new routine and speed ts sends are pretty straightforward um it's kind of like static like it's it's more about getting a lot of reps in than it is about specific routines. So I broke these into three different categories of routines uh, that focus on different things. The first one being speed, which is uh, gonna be what most people kind of gravitate toward as being their problem. What speed routines typically feature are a combination of big bots. So like jumbo versions of scenarios um, like Fox TS, Voltaic, Jumbo. 
and a lot of them also include wide angles. Um, this one I really like, this is by Gord. It's a, con you run it in total random. Focus is not just on speed, but on speed and technique. Um, it has all of the kind of primary speed TSNs that you would want to practice like Vox and Pat. And then it has variations of them. Like the Viscose Varied is a really great scenario because it starts with big bots and then slowly moves towards smaller ones. What happens if you just focus on jumbo sends, for example, like your brain knows that all the bots are going to be big so you just you could end up developing bad technique what you need to kill big bots isn't what you need to kill small bots very strongly suggest when you're running the jumbo versions of bots if you're doing the speed scenarios is not to overlook your technique while you're killing the bots it's easy to kind of like start swooping around and not having straight lines so pay attention to how you're eliminating the bots and still prioritize your technique while you're doing them. And you might even find that your hand and arm is getting a little worn out um, because you're going at a high speed, which is the point of the scenario is to kind of get comfortable with moving at a higher speed than you might normally do. I really like the Unans Just Move Your Hand Faster. It features uh, 90 degree versions of the Pat TS, uh, for example, which I, I like the easy and the 90 degree versions because it simplifies what it is that you're isolating. The way our brains work, it really helps when you're practicing to focus on like just one thing that you need to improve on. If, if you've got way too many variables that you're trying to do all at once, like your precise flicks, your accuracy, your speed, you know, your, uh, your straight lines, like your brain doesn't know what to improve on. So keeping it simple and just focusing on one thing while you're training can help you a lot. Uh, the next set of routines that I would suggest are really focused more around your flick accuracy and your precision. So what helps here is uh, if you look at Kraski, for example, he has a lot of Pokeball sends and um, a lot of precise Pokeball sends. With these, what you wanna be focusing on is your flick accuracy and you wanna be focusing on clean lines between your targets. When you're approaching the bot as you're trying to kill it, you generally wanna focus on under flicking rather than over flicking and then coming back because of the waste that's involved. Remember TS, really prioritizes minor, minor wasted movements, adding up to big differences in scores and your technique, not just your scores, but how well you execute this particular mechanic that you're learning. Whether it's gonna mean the difference between success and failure in an actual in-game scenario. So really pay attention to how you're performing your flicks. Keep reminding yourself that when you're performing your flicks that you wanna land on the bot as closely as possible like don't be okay with every flick being a micro adjustment you want to kind of punish yourself internally for missing the flick um, so you can run the Kraski static switch small you could also run the speed and flick accuracy from Unans. Unans is one of the best target switches out there and another thing you want to be aiming for with these routines is as little downtime as possible between targets like when you're moving from target to target, you want to hear the hit sound as often as possible. I know that sounds like obvious. I mean, the more damage you do, the better you're doing, right? But if you're hearing the hit sounds very consistently, like almost all the time, then that means that you're minimizing your waste as, as much as possible. And then the last specific type would be a large angle. Uh, type switching. So Viscos kind of touches on this in, in hers. Um, so does uh, Kraski because you have the 360 versions of the sends. I also like uh, Zen uh, target switch is right here. Zen target switch speed medium. So Lap Lapu is a grandmaster with like 3000 hours and Kovacs uh, put together some really great routines. Um, I, I like using these uh, six wall 14 targets Pokeball is amazing. You can get a lot of reps in with these types of scenarios, which are really great for your improvement overall, especially if you're just starting out. Um, just notice if you're doing these routines, there's going to be some evasive bots, which is fine. You know, it can't hurt to practice some evasive bots like Bounce 180 tracking is more of an evasive send. I would very strongly recommend doing these types of routines with the large angles, getting comfortable with parts of your mouse pad that you aren't using and I would prioritize not resetting your mouse as often as you might think you should. It also helps you with 
understanding how to flick when you can't see the bot on screen, which is actually really beneficial in games, especially if you're playing something like COD. Even great players like Viscose, you see them, like they'll do kind of like a ghost flick, not knowing where they're gonna need to correct after they get the new FOV angle. And being able to quickly adjust onto the target after doing that is really important. It also helps you with, most people struggle with, even if they're good at kind of shorter angle flicks, they struggle with large angle flicks. Um, their accuracy goes way down, so it's good to develop that. And just some more like general routines, you've got the pure target switching one by one, which has uh, just a variety of scenarios. And I like these Lapu enhanced switching beta, uh, large, medium, and small. So it's basically the order of difficulty just increases the smaller the bots get. Again, this has like dynamic scenarios, but pick the one that is most close to where you are in your aim development now. Um, and challenge yourself a little bit like you want to push yourself a little bit when you're when you're playing these routines like if you're getting bored you're not paying attention you're not engaged you're not focused or you're not frustrated then chances are you need to spend some time on smaller bots or more difficult scenarios than you're used to i haven't seen any routines that feature these but uh, you can do smooth versions of scenarios to help you with understanding bot TTK and also keeping on the bot and not flicking off of it uh, too soon. Basically ensuring that a bot's completely dead before moving on. It helps you kind of push the boundaries on what's acceptable there. Um, and it helps you with your stability after you're flicking because basically the smooth versions, they have health that regens. So if you just quickly flick and then flick off, kind of like Pokeball, um, but they move, it will penalize you and the bot's actually just gonna live. So you, it really forces you to have that accuracy and then stability and tracking on the bot after you flick to it. So that's it for the routines and the scenarios that I suggest to approach this aim mechanic. Uh, some of the common problems I see, the first is aping. Uh, I talked about this in my other videos, it's basically focusing too much on speed um, it's sort of like when you're just getting into weightlifting. This is something new players or newcomers in weightlifting do all the time. They just want to push. They want to see them pushing heavier weights than they can actually handle. And they're not developing the smaller muscle fibers and the right technique. And you can actually get injured that way. It's the same type of thing in target switching is people see those cool flicks. So they think that the only thing associated with that is just moving your mouse fast. And that's that's not it. Having the stability, having the accuracy is more important. Um, so you need to build that first. The next one is the poor target selection, um, reducing their scores and kind of giving a false impression of where they're at in their technique. Something to pay attention to. We talked about that in the viability. Pay attention to how you're approaching the scenario. Um, it could be the thing that's preventing you from not getting the scores you think sh you should be getting rather than your technique alone. Along the same lines, over confirming on targets, like staying too long on the target instead of switching off just in time, like just in time to kill it, uh, not switching off targets that aren't viable, like chasing targets, the same problem that you run into with dynamic clicking. An over-reliance on micro-corrections, I see this a lot with people that are really good with static. They are unable to translate that into target switching because they've developed their micro-correction technique so well, they absolutely need it in order to be good at the scenarios. Another problem is not paying attention to their stability after flicking and your flick accuracy. I had this problem for a really long time um, and I started emphasizing it and thinking about it as I'm training and my scores have improved drastically since then. Again, it's these really small wasteful things you're doing that you don't even notice that add up that is keeping your scores low. Another problem is resetting your mouse too much and not becoming familiar with parts of your pad that you're not used to uh, once you start doing those wide angle flicks that's really when it's gonna show up and then finally assuming you're doing everything else correctly then it's speed okay yeah sure you need to move your mouse faster in order to be good at target switching scenarios uh, but you know you can get probably in the 95 to 99 percentile without being like super fast like Unans or Gord um, or viscose. So don't worry about that first. I would say worry about that near the bottom of your priority list in terms of improving. So that's it for me. Even though Speed TS is pretty straightforward, I obviously had a lot to talk about in this particular one. We're going to be doing 
the evasive TS next, which hopefully should be shorter since it's only really changing one component of speed TS once you have this technique down. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, Follow my Twitter, tell your friends about my videos if you think that they're going to benefit from them. And also feel free to join the Peer G Discord so you can talk to me on a regular basis and other great aimers who are actually way better than me. Blah, blah, blah. Outro, outro. See you in the next video.